1930s, voortrekkers and the leadership of Hendrik Potgieter traveled past on their way north. They went past Makapans Valley. It's an easy place to go through, easy way to pass. Then in the 1840s, a gentleman by the name of Johan Enslin, um, he traveled through, got as far as Modimole, which is the old Nailstrom. And he was leading a group of people called the Jerusalem Gangers or Jerusalem Goers. That's as far as they got to the, the southern part of the water. Bed. In 1880, the Van Rooyens were the real family, the first family really, to penetrate into the interior of the Waterberg and settle. Now, the Van Rooyens was quite a big family, out of interest just so much so, that many of them went by nicknames. So there was Tiny, Johan Pieter Kranz, uh, Lekkerlach, Oom Hans Kanedaat, and uh, Oom Roy Kerniels, just to name a few. Of course, in 1899, the Second Boer War broke out, Anglo-Boer War, and by 1902, a lot of farms was given to British veterans of that war. As time carries on, more and more people came into the area and settled. In 2001, the Waterberg got proclaimed as a UNESCO biosphere, and today it's a popular wildlife destination for both international and local guests. But why is it called the Waterberg? We've got two seasons here, um, basically a wet and a dry, and our wet season is basically four months, maybe five if we're lucky, over summer. During that period of time, we can expect anything between 250 mil to 1000 millimeters of rain. But to understand why the Waterberg is called the Waterberg, we need to look at more than just the rainfall. To explain the geology, the history of the Waterberg, I'm going to take you back a little bit. Around 2000 million years ago, considering South Africa's Northern Promise, Northern Province, Limpopo, say so outline more or less like that. Of course, these cities weren't here 2,000 million years ago, but what did happen is, is two fault lines that come through this area. So just north of Morimole, there's a fault line um, called the Munchen or Tabazembi fault line. And then just to the north of Lepalale, there's another fault line. That one is called the Melinda fault line. And um, of course, 2000 million years ago, none of these towns were here. But what did happen is that underneath here, there was changes in the um, crust and a big part of the crust here went down especially around this area here now this went down quite deep and of course as soon as stuff goes down deep you've got water coming into a lower lying area and because of that quite a bit of sediment built on let's see if I can explain it better for you on the fault line a piece of land would have been dropped down quite deep as mentioned before low-lying areas will gather water 
with water, of course, comes sediment. And over time, the sediment layers built up and they carried on building up. As they built up, this got heavier and as such, it started going deeper and deeper down. But at some stage, there was an upthrust underneath this whole area. You remember we said these are between those two fault lines, the Melinda and the Munition fault lines, which is basically the whole area between Tabazambi, Lepalale and Morimole. After time, upthrust from the bottom and of course this whole thing got pushed up again. And the drawing is not great, but you still got sediment. And now what happens is a bit of erosion over the sides and these mountains typically end up looking like that. So typically these are these flat top mountains that we get around the Waterberg. And now what happens is if it rains you get of course water hitting the top of the mountain. This water will penetrate certain layers and other layers maybe not so much and you end up with water coming out the side of the mountain and as such it looks like the whole mountain is full of water if you enjoyed this Please feel free to give us a like, follow us, subscribe and keep watching. Thank you.